Riding shotgun refers to the practice of sitting next to the driver in a moving vehicle. The term riding shotgun came around after the time of the stagecoach when somebody used to sit next to the driver holding a shotgun in case they ran into bandits. My name is Charlie Cook and I drive a lot. I like to talk to people while I'm driving, so I interview people in my car while I'm driving. Welcome to Riding Shotgun with Charlie. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of Riding Shotgun with Charlie, and I am on the, the fun Minnesota trip to the Twin Cities area, and today I have with me, I have none other than, I call him the voice of crossbreed holsters, <laughs> it is Lee Michaels. Lee Michaels, it's a pleasure to be on with you. Thank you, Charlie. Lee Michaels is a operations manager at a radio station here in Minneapolis, but more importantly to me than that, he is one of my friends, one of my longtime friends' husband, which is how we ended up making all this stuff happen. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about we're going to drive we're going to drive shotgun with Charlie, and we're going to talk about how uh, your your incident and your story and how you got into uh, I don't want to say the shooting sports because it's not really a sport for you. No, it's really a uh, defense of my family and my person. Absolutely. So some people call it shooting sports. Some people are into, you know, I, this is something we talked about uh, before, and some people. Um, I, I like to say that not all gun owners are created equally. Right. So some people are into it for hunting, and the people that I know that are into it for hunting aren't into um, aren't into carrying concealed. And I know guys that carry concealed that don't want to don't want to hunt, and they're all created differently. So um, you didn't grow up hunting or shooting. Nope. Uh, we didn't have really guns in the home. We weren't anti-gun. It was just one of those things that didn't didn't really have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. And uh, when you you had an incident happen. That yeah. was, uh, I gotta tell you, it was, um, you brought me to where this happened the other night, and to me, I don't know how it was for you, but for me it was a very surreal. That was the, for, for anybody that doesn't uh, know who I am or hasn't seen my story, uh, I was actually, if you read uh, Lessons from Unarmed America by um, Mark Walters and Rob, Pincus. And, and Rob Pincus, I'm chapter five, and my story is one of situation awareness being aware of what's going around you and even though you're doing everything right you can still find yourself in a bad situation mm -hmm. um, and so last night when I took you the other night when I took you through and and actually walked through the entire scenario mm -hmm. that was the first time since that night that I actually did that wow. so it was a little freaky for me <laughs> standing there because again it was what was it it was about one in the, it was late at night it was late about at one night. in the morning was, yeah one in the so morning so it was Roughly about the time it happened. This happened midnight, 1 a.m. Mm. Uh, gosh, was that five, six years ago now? So uh, I was coming home, played hockey on Wednesday nights. It was a cool November night. I'm driving home. I uh, lived in a townhouse. It had a detached garage, and there was about six six of the garages in a row, and we were the end, end unit in our townhouse complex. And I always had my ritual what I did, things I talked to my wife about when I would uh, come home. I'm like, you see somebody in the parking lot, especially late at night, you know, you see them, make sure eye contact, where yep. they're going. Uh, if I had to, you'd circle the parking lot, pull into the garage, uh, drop the car in reverse, allow the garage door to close, and make sure nobody jumped in behind you. Kind of a typical ritual of what I would do. So always being aware of my surroundings, you know, not wanting to be caught off guard. This night, really no different than any other night. Come home, and as I'm pulling into the parking lot, here comes a guy on a bike, and I had to kind of stop short. I'm like, oh, and I see the guy, make eye contact, but look at him, okay, yep, jacket. Him and I see him, I see him kind of go around the corner. I'm like, cool, circle once, and I still see him riding away, and do the same thing, pull into my garage, drop the car in reverse, watch the rear view mirrors and the side mirrors. You know, nobody's following me in, garage door drops, okay, now, finish my water, put away my hockey stuff, and think, I probably, probably killed another five minutes in the garage before I stepped out. I step out of it, and right away, a guy comes walking around the corner of the garage next to me, and he kind of swings a little wide, and he says, uh, do you have any money? 
And so right then I'm like, okay, this is a little weird. That's the guy who's on the bike. Right. Where's his bike? Mm -hmm. And I, I glance behind me, do the old, okay, make sure nobody's behind me. Is he distracting me? You know, don't see anything. There's a long row of garages the other way. So there's still one, like five more garages the other way. So nobody there. And I take a step at, step at him because I'm a little bigger than he is. And I say, sorry, dude, I just came from hockey. I don't have anything for you. And right then, steps out another guy. Wow. With a gun yeah, pointed see, right at me. I tell I, I tell people when I teach classes, I say, listen, bad guys have friends. Yes. Bad guys have friends. And I expect, you know, I, I did do the look behind, but I'm looking at the guy, but again, he swings a little wide, and I should have realized that maybe there was something else, but that's what they do. Right. He's already drawn down on me at that, and, you know, even if I had a fireman at that point, you can't outdraw a drawn gun. You got gun. it. Uh, so, reaction every time. Yep. And he's got it pointed right at me, and literally... So I reach in my coat pocket, I pull up my keys and my wallet, and I take a step, and I'm like, dude, you got me. Here you go. Take it all. And I sort of I sort of look down a little bit. I'm like, I'm not going to stare at his face. I don't want to give him a reason to think that this guy knows he's got a good look at me or anything like that. Yeah. And he starts walking up to me, and then he kind of pushes my pushes my hand back at me. Mm -hmm. So I give me what I got. So I, I had a $20 bill and a free Chipotle Marino card. Which I'm more upset that I lost the free. I can imagine. Holy moly. Than the, uh, <laughs> than the what, $20 that's, bill. That's more than 20 bucks. Uh, I know. <laughs> Hand those to him. He's like, you got to have more than that. And I'm like, you can see my. There well, it is. I told you, you can take it all. Take the card. I don't care. Right. And uh, so then he starts telling me, he says, you got to have more than that. You got to have more than that. I'm like, I don't. Then he says, get on your knees. Puts me on my knees. So oh. now I'm sitting on the sidewalk right outside my garage looking up at my daughter's bedroom window. That's the part where I was like, oh my God. And you can you can see where, when we were there the other night where I was, I mean, it was right 20 there. feet to the bedroom window. Mm -hmm. The one night my wife goes to bed early, and I'm not 100% sure if that was a blessing or not, because right? I, 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 when they started asking me things, I started shouting, hoping my neighbor or even my wife would hear me and you know turn on a light or something. I wonder what's going on, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that would have freaked them out and done something drastic or not, but anyway, uh, it's a whole other <laughs> side note. But as I'm looking up to it, he puts me on my knees and he shoves the gun right up against the back of my head and says, I'm going to effing do him right now. Wow. Effing do him. And he sticks the barrel right right behind, right to kind of top of my ear. For 20 bucks. And right then, I'm looking up and I had, I felt this fear, panic. I mean, it was really weird. And you start talking about what happens to your sympathetic nervous system when things like that happen. The tunnel vision, the auditory loss, things like that. So he tells me that. And I, I visualize myself falling face forward and thinking, in two hours, now why I thought two hours, I have no idea, but my <laughs> wife will find me in two hours face down and I could see the pool of blood that was going to be where I fell forward right. as he put a bullet through the back of my head. And and it just, it was just a weird sensation. And then right then I hear him say, well, where's your bank? And I'm thinking, why is he asking me about my bank? And right then I had this sensation, that it was almost a tingle, it went right through my head to my feet. And I went, okay, I'm going to get out of this. Mm -hmm. And everything changed. So now, um, uh, and we'll go west. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking, okay. And right then I went, okay, he wants me to take him to the bank. Well, A, that ain't going to happen. I, you're not going to go to a secondary location. Tell my right. wife and my daughter, do what you got to do. You do not go to a secondary crime scene. Exactly. As they say. Exactly. That's, that's the second scene of the crime. Yep. So I'm the sitting there, and I and so now I'm on my knees, and he, he's telling me, he's talking about the bank. So I'm telling him where my bank is. I'm jumping off. Look, okay, tan boots, black pants. Uh, I look, and I'm like, and I basically turn on and I'm like, well, tell me what the F you want. And as I turn to look at him, and the barrel of the gun is, you know, oh three inches from my face, and I, it looks like I'm looking down a 105 meter it doesn't howitzer. <laughs> I tell you, it doesn't matter if it's a 22. When it's pointed in your face, yeah. that is that's Just, a howitzer. You know, I'm pretty sure it was a, a semi-auto nine. As I, I looked down the barrel past him, and he had his skull cap kind of over his face. He had a right. black hoodie, so all I could see was you Just know his eyes. His eyes. Yeah. And I, I turned and I look at the guy. So the other guy who originally asked me about the money, he had walked around behind me. As he gets around, so then at that point, I turn and look back at him, and I see him, he's got pants, jeans, uh, 
you know, tan boots. He's wearing it's like a Phillies jacket, you know, like a blue jacket with red sleeves, a big logo on the on the breast. And he's got just got his hands at his side. So I look back and like, okay, I don't see any weapons. If he had a knife, if he had a gun, he's It'd most likely it's out. gonna be in his hand. Yeah. Because even after the other guy comes out, he's you know, so I'm like, okay, that's cool. So they're, I'm telling him where my bank is, and, and again, at first he says, give me your bank card. And I just got new ones. So I'm like, well, you think I'm going to give you the real pin, buddy? But here's my old one. <laughs> right. <laughs> I hand him the card. He looks at it. And then he hands it back to me, and he says, well, you know, he's going again about where's your bank, and I tell him where it is. And he's like, all right, get up. So he stands me up, puts his hand on my shoulder, puts the gun right at the base of my neck. I open no. the garage service door. I step in. I open the garage door immediately, mm -hmm. thinking, even at 1 in the morning, there's a lot of people coming and going. Sure. I open a car, we'll pull in something, we'll kind of spook these guys or right. you know, who knows what. It doesn't happen. But also in my garage, I have to park all the way to right, single car garage. You cannot get in the car on the passenger side, mm -hmm. period. As he uh, picks me up, and again, so at this point now, I've really kind of tuned him out because I know if I get in the car uh, and they try to get in on the passenger side, not that gonna is not going to work. Right. And so I'm thinking, you know, if I, and I've thought about these scenarios, and this goes back to things I've done. If knowing somebody can't get in the car on that, and what that's, that's do, an advantage for you, knowing that I've talked about this before with my with my wife. I said if somebody gets in my car. I'm most likely, if when, I, when I left there, there's a 24-hour Walgreens and a White Castle, and there's a retaining wall at this stoplight. Yeah. And when I get to that corner and turn to go to the bank, I'm gonna I'm gonna ram the I'm gonna ram, ram the wall. Ram the car into it, absolutely. And odds are that guy, he is, you know, a the airbags are gonna deploy. Mm -hmm. I know it's coming. He he's probably not gonna shoot because you're in an accident now. The last thing you do is shoot somebody, and then everybody's looking and. You're running because there's a fair amount of traffic at that intersection. Yeah. But anyway, so that's kind of the thing. If I have to do that, I'll do that. So the, the guy without the weapon who originally approached me tries to get in behind me. Well, my daughter's car seat is in there. And he's yanking in it and he can't get it out and he can't figure out how the thing works. Yeah. And now the other guy is yelling. I, I just I know they're yelling at each other. I got no idea what he's saying because I'm thinking, I got a phone in my coat pocket, so I'm gonna reach in my coat dial 911. I just got gas that night and I grab it and I hear the receipt and it sounds like you know you got a piece oh. of cellophane. I'm thinking, <laughs> right. obviously it's after, the afterwards thing I think about it like heard. they can't they couldn't have heard that their life depended, but I was gonna dial 911 in my pocket. And uh, then the uh, so I stop that, I put my hands back on the wheel, and the guy slides over, climbs over the car seat, and gets into the passenger side, mm -hmm. rear seat. The guy with the gun then realizes he can't sit behind me. So he starts to walk around, he walks around the car, and I'm just watching him, I'm thinking, okay, when he gets up to the side, when the car door opens, that's a pretty natural place for a car to start. Right. So as he, he walks up and I see him and as he comes around the back of the car, he's got the gun. Right before he leaves, he smacks me with the gun a couple of times. And then as he walks around, just watch him in the mirror, he got both hands on the steering wheel, basically just sweeps his buddy in the back seat as he walks past because bad guys don't train. Bad guys don't train. <laughs> and we'll go 77 south. Okay. And then uh, as he walks up, and between the wall and the garage, it looks like you can kind of walk straight. It looks like there's enough room. Mm -hmm. But you know, car doors with the armrests and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, not enough space. Once you open that, you know, there's no way he gets in. So he gets there, he reaches down, he's looking at me, and I'm just kind of glancing over. He reaches with the left hand, opens the door, mm -hmm. swings it open, and it hits the wall. And as he opens it up, he turns to to get in the car, you know, like you know, right. when the second he turns, in. so now the gun is on his chest. I can't I can't see the see the gun anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well. That's what I've been waiting for. This is your opportunity. Reverse and punch it. I don't care if I rip the garage, the door, the door where I don't care what I do. Absolutely. And so I, I punch it. And I'm, at that time I had a, a Cadillac SDS with a 300 North Star. All 300 horsepower kick in at that <laughs> point. And I literally rock it out of the garage. And you know the traction control kicks in so there's no tires right. squealing or anything. And I, and I ducked down. And you saw how big this parking lot is. I mean, it's yeah, it probably was, 40 yards. Yeah, it, you was, know? it was pretty big. You know, it's a decent size, but not huge. 
And I kind of ducked down. So in this time, in, the, in probably the three or four seconds it takes me to go from inside the garage to the back of the parking lot, mm -hmm. as I'm looking back, I see the guy frantically yanking the door handle who's in my back seat. Yeah. He can't open it because the Baby door's locks. all locked. Yeah. When you, get, when you get into gear. Oh, okay. So then he leans back, and I see him kicking the window. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, with safety glass, unless you have a pointy object, you're... <laughs> It's not, it's not gonna break. So he's kicking the he's kicking the window. I get to the end of the parking lot there and I, I lock it up. I kind of spin the car around. And as I look back and I can see the guy lying on the floor of my garage. He's on his he's kind of on his hands and knees. And I'm like, I'm not waiting around to Just see figure what, out what's going on. How right? bad he is or what. And I realized my my side mirror is still there, my door is still there, my garage looks intact. And I think what happened is when I did it, it you know, it pushed him back, it spun him, mm -hmm. and it closed the door, mm -hmm. and it either pushed him up against the wall or pinned him. I mean, that guy had to be limping oh for a gosh, while. Yeah. I kind of wish I would have done one of these and just pushed him through the wall, but, uh, you know, that would have turned the car, and, you know, who knows how far I would have got then. But anyway, yeah. so as I take off now, the guy in the back seat, I'm going to have to mess you up, and he's trying to swing at me, so I'm, you know, I keep my elbow up, and he can't reach around this way because the headrest has the big seat belt thing here. Yeah. And he's he breaks my turn signal. He's you know the cup holders are breaking. He's you know he's just thrashing around in the car, and I'm kind of fighting him off. And as I'm pulling out of my townhome complex, uh, he reaches down and knocks the car into neutral. So when I take my second hand off the wheel to put it back in gear, because now I'm going to drive to the police station, which is about a half mile away. Yeah. Uh, with him in my car and just say, hey, I got a guy for you here. <laughs> <laughs> I got a live one for you. <laughs> and as I, as I come uh, out of there, he grabs the wheel, kind of pulls me out of the grass, and there's a few trees there, and I realize, okay, I, I'm not going anywhere back now, so I lock it up and I bail. And there's a row of townhomes from in between where my garage was and where I'm gonna go towards that 24-hour Walgreens. And I'm thinking, well, I'm gonna double back on the guy, so if, if the guy in the garage can get up and is chasing the car, mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I got a row of homes on me and double it back. And by the time he turns that corner, I'm I'm gonna be 200 yards away. Yeah. And that's because I'm dialing 911 as I go, and I get the 911 operator. I've just been robbed. I've just been carjacked. Here's my address. And as I get to the uh, kind of a busy road, all of a sudden I see this officer just hauling down the street. He doesn't have his lights on. And later he tells me, well, I, I didn't know if you were running from something to something or trying to catch a bus, but he was catching up to see why I was running so fast. Right. Because he figured at first I was probably up to no good. Mm -hmm. He gets there, I tell him, I just I hang up on 911, and 30 seconds later, I think every Brooklyn Park officer is on the scene. And I just start telling the story over and over and over for you know, a good hour or so. Then we go back, we walk through the whole scenario. And as we get to where my car is, there's about three squad cars, two canine units, and now I can hear dogs in the neighborhood behind going crazy. Wow. He's, this guy in the car bailed. Canine unit tracked him to a house, and basically, I hear on the radio, get the warrants, call for SWAT, because they got a standoff situation. Oh Turns out the guy who didn't have the gun, they end up sending him out because they found his jacket. He ran in, stuffed his jacket behind the garbage can outside the house, and then... Uh, they, um, whoever's in the house probably said, you're taking one for the team, kicked him out. Long story short, <laughs> he denied that he had anything to do with it. He, he said he saw me, but I, it was BS. But they had taken his shoes because I told him he'd been kicking the window. Mm -hmm. When I picked my car up from the uh, impound lot after they dusted, they didn't find any fingerprints, but inside the rear passenger window, there was a perfect shoe print. Oh my you could gosh. have not taken that shoe, rolled it in ink, <laughs> and pressed it in better. I mean, you could read Converse or whatever, oh whatever it was gosh. on the glass still in my car when I picked it up. That's wild. And uh, so at that point, they had him, and he ended up pleading a deal and spent 54 months in a state penitentiary. And he was the guy that didn't get the money. Yeah. And they would have dropped his sentence if he would have rolled on his buddy, which he did not do. He kept silent for that one. Un unbelievable. So that was the catalyst that went, okay, I think I need to do what else, can I, do? What else yeah. can I do? And that's what really kind of launched me into uh, Personal defense, yep, right. getting the gun rolled, uh, getting my permit, um, and doing what I do now, which is a passion. You know, I guest host. I've guest hosted on Mark Walters' Off American Radio's Daily Defense. Actually, I've had That's you as awesome. a guest I have been a, a couple, couple of times, times to talk it's about gun tram uh, yeah. in the past, and I think another time we had just to talk about uh, uh, the day stuff. San Bernardino yep. happened. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So and that's kind of what launched me to that and, and that whole deal. So now the training that I do, and 
and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, really revolves around that. I've had a chance to privilege and train with some really great guys too. Yeah, I, I uh, I've met Peter Johnson. You've worked with him before. He's yep. a, he's a great guy. Really knowledgeable. Knows what he's doing. Yep. So uh, yeah. That's, so that's that's kind of cool. my story. That's that's what and got you can, into it. You can read it in Lessons from Unarmed America. It's been written up in Concealed Carry Magazine uh, that two cool. two times. Uh, I think and that's so, that's great. Not that it's great. Yeah, but and I cool. and, and so the, the lesson for that in, in reading Pincus's breakdown of my story, mm -hmm. because there really isn't anything he you know he was like, well maybe you could have given the money right away rather than saying no, right? Uh, maybe you know I mean there just there isn't a whole lot. And again, looking at this, even being in a situation where I've thought of a scenario like this before, mm -hmm. and still find yourself because just because you have lots of training or you think you know what you're doing. Bad guys set the time and place for everything. They they do, which is which is what uh, Rob Pinkus's counter ambush is all about. Yeah, and so you have to be, you, you can't feel bad that you got caught or found mm -hmm. in a situation like that because uh, no matter how good you are, that can still happen to anybody. And if you think you're above that, you're not. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you right now. And not that I was perfect through that mm -hmm. scenario, but going through all that stuff, you know, people have asked me that. What if you know if you had your gun again, like. I, I you wouldn't have had a chance. Yeah, you wouldn't have had, had an opportunity. Had, you know, to do it over again, if I knew that, when I pulled up, would I know there was a guy? So the the guy who had the gun was probably hiding in the middle in the cars, and when I circled, I just didn't see him. It's dark, it's night, you can't sure. check every single nook and cranny. Right. Would I, have, would I have drawn my weapon and had it at my side when I walked out of the garage? Maybe, maybe not. Right. Would I still been able to, with a guy having a gun point at me, even bring that up to get no, an effective round? You know, me personally, probably would have not tried that shot. Yeah, that's, because that's a risky shot. Action beats reaction every time. And yeah. he's already got the gun on you. All he's got to do is this. You've got to pull the gun out, point it in his direction, squeeze yeah. the trigger. So it's, you know, a lot of variables go to that. So really it comes down to, um, you know, be prepared. Take the time to get good training, but don't think you're invincible. Because hey, I'll tell you now you're not. It's absolutely, it's not, it's not a talisman. It's not going to stop everything from yeah. happening. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, what else would I like to? There was something I was thinking of. Uh, training, being prepared. You did all the right things. You did all the right things, and it was it was good that you had a plan and you knew that there was an opportunity, and you were able to take that opportunity when it came up. And and it's not that I was paranoid, mm -hmm. and not that I live my life thinking there's a bad guy around every corner. Peter Johnson with Archway Defense, and you've had Peter riding yep. shotgun with you, uh, talks about that too. That um, you you. It's, it's not being paranoid. You're not thinking a ninja is going to drop out of every ceiling. But it's being aware and understanding the situation of where where you're at and what you're doing. And we all know there's times when you're going to, you know, driving down the freeway here to work, you're most likely not going to run into a bad situation. It could be a road rate situation. But again, as somebody who is a permit holder and carrier, you typically go out of your way to avoid, to avoid something like that. You know, some guy cuts me off. I'm not going to be the guy... That's that gonna gets out, screams and flips him flip the bird, him and, and I'm not gonna do anything. Swearing that's and shouting at him, absolutely. You know, somebody starts doing that to me. Um, you know, he's freaking out at me, or I realize he's following me. I'm taking a turn, taking a turn. If he's still following me, nine one one. Hey, I got some guy. I think he's upset at me for my driving. You know, here's where I'm going. I'm just gonna drive to the police station. Yep. You know, or whatever. But this guy's right, following me. Right, area or something. Yeah. You know, whatever, whatever, whatever you need to do to be safe. But you you know, so uh, you, you you have an idea. Then there's you know, and nowadays there's places you go, um, and where you're prohibited from oh, being me. able to defend yourself. Yeah, and that's a that's a whole nother show probably. <laughs> but uh, you know, there's lots of lots of things to be aware of. But I just I mean I strongly encourage people to get good training. Call Charlie. Call, yeah, absolutely. Call me up. <laughs> um, I took uh, I took a class a few years ago. It was a, a firearms retention. But it was also how to get a gun out of someone's hand. Yeah. And the the instructor that taught the class, he's a, he's a great guy. He's a little bit of a maniac, but he says if I can touch your elbow, I can get the gun out of your hand, and you're not going to shoot me. Yeah. And there's so many times, like hearing your story, I'm like, okay, would would that technique that he that I learned from him would that have worked to get to get the gun out of his hand? Yeah. I thought about, you know, if you if you know in a sweep, especially if you feel the muzzle of the gun against your back and, and turning I mean yeah you know after the fact I thought about some of those things but I'm like in that situation without it without more training I would have been wouldn't have, especially with the second guy there oh yeah it would have been 
you know, it would have been near impossible mm-hmm. uh, for me to uh, to do that. Yes, I could have maybe uh, avoided that, but those two guys, the second guy was going to be on me. Right. And, you know, that's just not a situation you want to find yourself in. Yeah, absolutely not. Uh, I heard somebody say one time, they're like, you know, if you push the slide back on a semi-auto, then yeah. it's, it's, it's on a battery yeah. and it can't be fired. But you can't, you can't, one, you can't rely on that. Uh, two, you need a plan after that. Like, here's a fast, here's a fast plan A. Now we need a plan B. Yeah. You know, we don't, we don't have time to be fooling around with uh, yeah. whatever with other stuff. So yeah, that's that's kind of my story. What launched me into launched uh, launched into taking this. Cool. Now, um, uh, how does the licensing procedure go here in Minnesota? Minnesota is a shall issue state. Nice. So, which is which is great, and we've had a huge. We're very we're a blue state. But we have a lot of outdoorsmen and things like that, so we're a fairly gun-friendly state. Right. Uh, but here, permit process, you make your application, uh, full background check, uh, and you need to take your class. Typically, a class is going to be a day, eight hours. There are online classes that you can take uh, at your home, and we do have a range requirement. Uh, and depending on the instructor, that could be as you know few as a couple of rounds, or it could be you know, a whole box of rounds. It's really kind of up to the instructor. There's no yeah. state standard minimum that you it's need just, to do. It's yeah, not it like... Just says some live firing? Yep, some live firing. You need to live fire. You get signed off. And then it's a matter of taking it to the sheriff's office uh, in the county where you live mm-hmm. and submit it. Pay your 100, 120 bucks. Depends on which county you're in. Mm-hmm. And 30 days later, they'll respond with either your permit or... Sorry, we declined it. But yeah. if you are... If you pass the background check, which means you... Uh, don't have any felonies. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't have a um, restraining order against you. Right. Ever been committed to a mental mental uh, institution uh, or, or treatment? You know they'll they'll bring up a, a drug treatment. Um, right. Deal. Uh, that's yeah. That's that's always good to have. I, good to have all the clear background check. I, I like to call my gun license my good guy card. Yep. And I go right through the list of things that I haven't done in order to get it. And you know, like you were saying, if if you if you get your gun license, you're passing a background check. If, if you, excuse me, if you pass a background check, you're going to get your gun license. Once somebody has their gun license, they don't want to lose that. Yeah. So there's the most law-abiding people out there. There are, because you know what? I've got this little piece of paper from the government that says I can carry a gun in places where I can carry a gun. And I can, in my state, I have to have one in order to own one. Yep. I don't want to do anything to not to lose that. I like that. I think it's a lot of fun. I don't want to do anything to lose the ability to have some sort of a, some sort of a gun. So, you know, I... I like to tell people I'm a little conscious about my speed when I drive. Yep. Um, you know, I, I avoid drinking and driving. I avoid I avoid doing stupid stuff. If there's uh, it, if somebody's there's a road rage incident, I mean, I try to certainly try to avoid those, and I've successfully avoided them for a long time. But you want to de-escalate and say, hey, listen, you know what, man, I'm really sorry. I cut you off. It's my fault. I apologize. You know, try to try to de-escalate it so it doesn't yep. turn into a situation where some guy starts screaming and shouting and freaking out and yep. pulling out a tire iron and, and threatening with you, threatening yeah. you with. Well, that's the last thing any of us want to do is ever have to use our weapon in a self-defense situation. Exactly. Um, but in this day and age, in where we are, uh, the reality of those things in active shooter situations are something that. It's a possible. It's it, it is. Yeah. Well, and, and here we have the Mall of America. You went to the Mall of America. I did go to the Mall of you know, America. Mall of America is here is a gun-free zone. Glad I only no. had my tactical pen. Yes. Minnesota, though the <laughs> the signs do not carry not the force, force of, law. of law. Yep. No, in Massachusetts they don't have the force of law either. Yeah, and that's where when you travel, whenever you do anything, you know, take the time to be aware of the laws where you're going. Ignorance mm-hmm. of the law is not an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and I, you know, everybody talks about having national reciprocity. I'm all for it. I think yep. it's a great idea. But in some states, you can the the no gun signs have the force of law. In some states, they don't. Yep. In some places, you can carry in a place that serves alcohol, but you can't be drunk. In some places, you cannot carry in a place that serves alcohol. Yeah. In some places, you can have a drink. In some states, you cannot have any alcohol yep. if you are carrying your firearm. I think it's interesting. After Orlando happened. Uh, North Carolina came up about a week later, and they said we're going to allow people to carry in a bar yep. if they have a concealed stories. carry permit, but they can't be intoxicated. Yep. So you can carry in a bar, and everyone's like, "Oh my God, you're going to get drunk and shoot somebody." Mm, you know what? If you're the designated driver, yeah. 
rock on. That's 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 what you can do. And it says you can't you can have the gun, but you can't be drunk. And obviously that's what we want as, as law-abiding citizens. We, we kind of put ourselves to a higher standard than most, not that most people do, but we, we do put ourselves to a higher standard that's because, right. again, right. we, we want to keep our good guy license. Because that, by losing my license, that puts me in a situation where I'm not able to uh, protect your family. Protect my family. And that's what it's about. I didn't get into shooting until after I had a kid. And uh, when my son, my son was nine months old when September 11th happened, and that's when I was like, you know what? There's bad guys out there. Yes, sir. I need to be able to protect me and my 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 wife and my kid. And and for me, it's you know it's the same thing for you. It just becomes it just becomes a way of life. It's just a lifestyle that you you get up and you put a gun on and, and you pay attention to your surroundings and you drive safe. It's just it's just what you do. Yeah. So, listen, Lee. It's been a pleasure having you on. I I appreciate you sharing sharing your story with our people. And I honestly. I, Peter said we need to come back and get some range time. Yes, you kinda, do. Which kind of freaks me out because he's, <laughs> he's he's an unbelievable shot. So that's kind of intimidating. <laughs> if I can shoot with Peter, you can shoot with Peter. <laughs> well, I uh, I would love to do that sometime. And uh, next time I come back, I'm going to have to make it so I can I can bring some hardware. We'll do and that. we can throw some lead down range. So anyway, we've had Lee Michaels. Lee Michaels works at... Uh, AM1280 The Patriot, AM Salem Media Group. There we go, right here in Minneapolis. And it's been an honor to uh, to honor to have you, Lee. Uh, you guys can find my videos at Riding Shotgun with Charlie. I've got a Facebook page, I've got a YouTube channel, and I'm going to get the website up and going so you guys can find me there. Charlie, Lee. I can't thank you enough. I've really been looking forward to Riding Shotgun with Charlie. Man, I, I, I can't... I can't say I appreciate. I do. I can't say I appreciate enough. I totally appreciate it. Thank you guys, you, you guys have opened your house to uh, to me and my family, and it's it's been a great trip here. We, You're welcome anytime. I appreciate, it, man. Thanks a lot, Lee. Thank you. All right, we'll talk to you guys soon.